Okay, cell biology fans, we got to finish up the lecture on membranes and membrane structure from the other day. What should be crystal clear to you is that we have uh, these membranes that can form by themselves, so they can aggregate uh, together using hydrophobic force, and that hydrophobic force will allow for the fatty acid tails of the phospholipids as well as fatty acid tails found on cholesterol or other fats that are inserted into membranes. Um, to aggregate to protect themselves from water to stay away from the aqueous solutions found both in the extracellular media as well as the intracellular cytoplasmic uh, media. So uh, we had begun talking about the asymmetry of phospholipids and the fact that you have phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidyl, um I'm sorry, phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin that are normally on the outside of the uh, lipid bilayer on the extracellular face, so this is the extracellular side I'm showing where the sugars are found, and there's a reason for that when we start talking about biosynthesis, this will become crystal clear. And on the inner surface of the membranes you find phosphatidylserine, the one that's negatively charged, and that can flip out and signal a cell that is undergoing apoptosis, and phosphatidylethanolamine. Now, I did say that there are other phospholipids. In particular, the one that I didn't mention is phosphatidyl inositol, PI. And phosphatidyl inositol plays an enormous role in intracellular cell signaling that we will talk about at a later date. Uh, it, phosphatidyl inositol makes up less than 1% or less than 2% of the total phosphoinositides, phospholipids in cells. And so you're going to see that uh, even though they're in small quantities, they have a huge role. What are the four phospholipids that you should know? You should know phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, and sphingomyelin. Those are the four main phospholipids that make up the cell membrane as well as all the membranes that are associated with intracellular organelles. And don't forget, cholesterol also plays a huge role, and that cholesterol is found in all membranes. It has the nonpolar hydrocarbon tail, it has this rigid ring structure, and then it has the polar head group on the very top that interacts with the uh, polar head groups of the phospholipids. And that cholesterol, the amount of cholesterol in a membrane, can alter its structure due to the rigidity of the steroid rings that are part of the cholesterol structure. And we had just started talking about structures within structures, the, the occurrence of lipid rafts in membranes. So those areas where there are more hydrocarbon, right, more saturated hydrocarbon tails, more sphingolipids, so you see more SNM and more cholesterol, so more SNM and more cholesterol in these lipid rafts, and longer, straighter, uh, lipid tails that lead to this sort of bump or this raft in membranes. And this can be found in, the lipid rafts can be found in the plasma membrane as well as other membranes inside the cell. So functions of lipid rafts, we, we began talking about that, so as far as signaling goes. And how did we come about finding this? How did these structures really show up? Well, people started fooling around by treating cells with drugs, and one of those was this, this drug called beta-methocyclodextrin. And beta-methocyclodextrin actually removes cholesterol from membranes, and what they did was when they treated a cell with this, they then noticed that those cells were no longer capable of doing the signaling events that those cells normally did. So that gave them the idea, so they knew that beta-methocyclodextrin removes cholesterol, and that cholesterol was important, and then they started looking, why is cholesterol important? Are there areas where you can find more cholesterol in the membrane? And that was how lipid rafts actually came into our view, and now we know a lot more about lipid rafts because of these sorts of findings. It's not just that you have lots more cholesterol, you have a lot of um, proteins that have particular lipid modifications to them that are found in lipid rafts. So we, we know that there's this asymmetry of phospholipids and that flip-flop, 
So, right, that's the flipping of a, a phospholipid from one side to another occurs specifically when cells are undergoing apoptosis. And I don't know tons about that flip-flop process, but I do know that it requires, in some cases it requires energy, in some cases it doesn't require energy. It's going to either be a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction depending on what's going on in the cell at the time. I did mention, right, phosphatidyl inositol is going to be important. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about with respect to asymmetry is glycolipids. So what are glycolipids? These are lipid structures that are modified with a sugar, and you're going to see that they are always on the non-cytosolic side of the membrane. So that means if, it's a, if we're looking at a cell, I'm going to just pinch this up a little bit, all right? If we're looking at a cell structure, if you have glycolipids, those glycolipids are going to stick out right on the extracellular side of the plasma membrane. What if it's in an organelle inside the cell? Well, they can only be on the non-cytosolic side. So the sugars, the glyco part of the glycolipid, always end up in what is the same as the extracellular space. And interestingly, the inside, the lumen of organelles, so the inside of organelles is basically the same as being outside the cell or the extracellular space. So you can have uh, glycolipids that face the internal surface of organelles in cells. Well, it's not just lipids and fats that are in membranes. We also have a ton of proteins in membranes. And the easiest way to understand uh, membrane proteins is some of them are integral membrane proteins. And in means that it actually has a portion of the protein in the membrane. And so each of these large proteins shown here, um, all of the proteins shown here, look like they have some portion of the membrane in the lipid bilayer of, it could be the plasma membrane, it could be an organelle, but it's in a membrane. Now this is very different than if you have a protein, let me draw, let's draw a blue protein, okay, that's here, that might be inside the cell and it could be linked into the membrane with a lipid tail that's associated with it. This is not an integral membrane protein. No portion of the protein is in the membrane. So this is what we would call a peripheral membrane protein. Now each of these images shows proteins that are integral membrane proteins. The first one shows an integral membrane protein that has an alpha helix that spans the bilayer. So this is a one pass transmembrane protein. So transmembrane, all right, transmembranes often are alpha helices. And these alpha helices, there's no space really down in between that helix. It's a very tight little helix. Um, this protein also has a lipid modification that helps link it to the plasma membrane. The second one shows you a three pass. So it's passing through the membrane one time, two times, three times. So this is a three pass transmembrane integral membrane protein. Now number three, all right, is this beta barrel. We don't actually say how many passes it has. We would say this is a beta barrel. The beta barrel has, it's a transmembrane protein, and often beta barrels actually do have space in the middle of the barrel that is aqueous. Not so in these alpha helices over here, okay? So there's really no internal space in an alpha helix. And finally, 4 is the very weird one in this group. This is actually a transmembrane protein because this is in the membrane. It's clearly in the membrane. And, and might, what might you guess about the R groups that are sticking off of these uh, amino acids? They're going to be the hydrophobic ones. So they're going to be alanine, glycine, uh, valine, leucine, isoleucine. The hydrophobic amino acids are what interact best with the hydrophobic lipid tails of the membrane. Beta barrels, though, are very different, and I want to make sure you're clear about this. In a beta barrel structure, 
right? There is space that goes down in through this that's aqueous. So you can have these beta sheets that make up the barrel and sticking out from them, so you might have amino acid R groups stick out from this towards the phospholipid uh, fatty acid tails, you might also have, so if you were looking down on this structure, right, if you were looking down, you might have R groups that stick out. That's what I'm showing you here. But you might also have R groups that stick in, and the R groups that stick in are going to want to interact with the aqueous environment, and so those are going to be polar head groups, whereas the ones that stick out are mostly going to be the hydrophobic non-polar R groups. Okay. This beta barrel structure actually came from bacteria and we see it a ton of these in mitochondria and chloroplasts because mitochondria and chloroplasts are actually modified bacteria that were uh, phagocytosed by eukaryotic cells. And the clever name for a lot of these are porins because they act as pores. Peripheral membrane proteins, as I already said to you, don't have any part of the protein in the membrane. They can have other parts of protein structure, any modifications, either through sugars or lipids. Um, and the other thing about peripheral membrane proteins, they can actually be proteins that are uh, linked to transmembrane protein or an integral membrane protein. So both of these green proteins are linked to transmembrane proteins through noncovalent interactions and they are considered peripheral membrane proteins because they really are associated on the on the very inner surface or outer surface of the membrane. So how do we begin, right, I we're talking about some methodology with our gene project, but we also have cell biology methods that you need to begin to understand to understand protein structure. So I'm going to talk about several of those here. Uh, one is a hydropathy plot, one is freeze fracture, liposome generation, and detergent solubilization. You want to put these away in your head because we're going to probably talk about uh, some of these in with respect to the genes that you're learning about, but then also um, these will come up on exams. So to start off with, the hydropathy plot. This is the kite doodle plot that we were talking about. So kite doodle were the people that most people use for a hydropathy plot. Kite. Oh, sorry, kite. K. Okay, let's try this again. Let's get rid of that. And hopefully I won't get interrupted for the third time. Okay, so kite, K-Y-T-E, Doolittle. Those were the people who made up the algorithm to figure this out. And in a kite Doolittle hydropathy plot, what we're looking at is this hydropathy index. And in reality, what that is doing is it's looking at approximately 20 amino acids at a time and saying, how much energy would it take to have this piece of, of an amino acid sequence be soluble in water? And so if it's uh, 20 amino acids that are polar, it takes no energy whatsoever, right? And so the number is less than zero. So on these plots, below the zero line is hydrophilic. And above the line means that you have these regions that are hydrophobic. And it would require hydrophobic. It would require a lot of energy to solubilize these regions, and these often coincide with transmembrane domains. Now, what's interesting is that you're actually looking from, you know, on the bottom axis, if you look, you're looking from amino acid zero all the way to the end of your protein, so maybe this is 140 amino acid protein, whereas this one on the right is maybe 220 amino acids total. And you see areas above and below the line. Now, on this particular graph, I, I like this a lot, uh, above each graph they tell you the protein name, so A is glycophorin, and they give you this box, all right, this rectangle, 
where they're showing you the amino terminus on the left, the carboxyl terminus on the left. What do I not like about that? It says NH2 versus COOH, right? It should be NH3 plus with COO minus. But uh, this is the sequence of amino acids from 0 to, what did I say, 140. And they're just showing you a little extra green box. So the light green is where it's hydrophilic, and the dark green is where it's hydrophobic. So glycophorin looks like a one-pass transmembrane protein if indeed that hydrophobic portion is membrane-bound. Now, if you look at the example in B, it's a little different. This is a, a very well-known protein called bacteria, bacterial rhodopsin. It is um, a seven-pass transmembrane protein, and it's hard to really tell based on hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So in the plot, they show you regions that are light green and regions that are dark green, and they're saying the dark green ones are transmembrane domains. And what you see is that there are actually some light green areas that are still above this dotted line I just drew for you. So even though it might take some energy to solubilize some portions of membrane, it, they may or may not actually be domains that are transmembrane domains. So you would have to have some sort of cutoff value. And if you do that cutoff value, all right, I didn't do a very straight line, but you see the big, the ones that are above that, number one, two, three, three is just barely above it, four, five, six is just barely above it, and seven gives you the seven transmembrane domains. So the, the kite doolittle is the hydropathy plot that can give you some information about a protein. So these are the words that I just spoke about, the hydropathy plots, looking at regions of 10 to 20 amino acids at a time. And, and literally what they do is they take amino acid 1 to 20, and they say how much energy would be required for that, and then they do 2 to 21, 3 to 22, all the way through the entire protein. And right, you wouldn't want to do this by hand, and that's why they do a computer program. And that computer program is doing some calculation based on the number of hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids in any sequence of 20 amino acids. Okay. And this is going to give you a prediction of the structure, which then allows you to predict what the function of that protein might be. If it's not a transmembrane domain containing protein, it's a cytosolic or an extracellular protein, maybe it's a hormone, maybe it's a molecule important for movement, right? It's, it's not going to be something that would have a membrane bound function. So just remember, if we're talking about structure, we're going to ultimately end up talking about function. So here is the a transporter protein, and the hydropathy plot is shown here. Let me just make it all show up on the screen. Oops, sorry. And so this is an amino acid transporter, and if you look at it, right, they're giving you some cutoffs, upper cutoff, lower cutoff, and saying, where are the transmembrane domains? So it's nice, they're showing you on the bottom the actual protein, and in the gray bars, so here's a gray bar and here's a gray bar, those are where the amino acids that go through the membrane are located. So this is a protein that has one pass, two pass, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. A twelve, so this would be a twelve pass transmembrane protein. You know, you can start thinking, what the heck does a 12-pass transmembrane protein do? Well, maybe, right, it creates a pore. Maybe it's some type of beta barrel. Who knows, all right? We don't know until we study it more, but this is information that we can get from very easily looking at a hydropathy plot. So that's one technique. That's just a prediction. A uh, different technique is called freeze fracture. And this is interesting. So if you take cells and you freeze them in very, 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 very cold liquid nitrogen. Um, now the cells are basically hard, but if you uh, smack the cell, 
what happens is that the membrane can fracture between the lipid bilayers. So the actual, the lipid parts separate when this happens. And you end up, this is taking the Oreo cookie, and sometimes when you split an Oreo cookie, you get the white stuff on either side. And what this freeze fracture technique allows you to do is to see things that are embedded in the membrane. In this image, the red proteins are sticking in the membrane, and you can see places on the opposite side of the membrane where there's holes, and those holes are where proteins used to be. So when we freeze the, the lipid bilayer, we freeze the cell, the proteins lose some of their ability to interact with the lipids, and so when you lift off one half of the lip lipid bilayer, it actually can come away from the proteins. There are limitations to this technique, and the limitation, the main limitation, is that you have to have a pretty big protein to be able to see it by freeze fracture. So the size of the protein will limit whether you can see it or not. So this is showing you, right, and when they're talking about a knife, they're talking about something hard that you hit the, hit the cell with, so hit it on the side, it's frozen, and if you pull apart the piece of ice, sometimes the proteins stay on this side, sometimes the proteins stay on that side, and you, right, so this is just showing you the different sides. I'm not going to remember E face and P face. I don't really care if you do, but understand how the technique works. And so this is one of the most beautiful images, I think, in biology because it's a freeze fracture showing one side. So this is the, the sort of the top side, and then this is the underneath side. So pretend like the top side has been flipped over and every bump that you see in this image, so if I get a close-up, right, every bump that you see, right, each one of these little knobby things, there's a billion of them, show up and you see knobs on this inner part as well, and maybe you see holes, it's hard to tell. But in this image, those are all protein complexes in the membrane of these particular cells. So that's pretty powerful just to look at this. Okay, let's squeeze it back down. If you look at this image and and think about this, this is a, a membrane. These are complex of proteins in a membrane. Membranes are filled with proteins. There are a ton of proteins, and there's tons of lipids, but they're interacting with one another. All right, so that's freeze fracture, right? I'm not really giving you all that much information. I'm giving you some information about tools you could use to understand proteins. Another old school method, so this is old, maybe not something that you would use these days. You might, though, um, depending on what you're doing, is something called red blood cell ghosts. And what's important about red blood cells? I mean, we all know these are red blood cells down here. They have this particular shape. They carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. And so they're really important for getting O2 to their tissues. But one of the really nice parts about red blood cells is they're non, right, they don't have a nucleus. So they're no nucleus, or they're called enucleated. And so, if you think about that, what a red blood cell is, it's basically a bag. Right? Here's a red blood cell in its normal structure. If you were to make a break in the membrane, and there's lots of different ways to make breaks in membranes, all the stuff can leak out and then you just have a membrane that you could use to start studying things and it's nice because it really is a cellular membrane and so the membrane can reform as it was before so if the membrane still has leak holes in it, it's still leaky, if it's sealed, it's sealed and if you take those membranes and shake them up you can get the membrane to right seal with the correct side out or the inside out. So that's why they're showing you the blue versus red. In the blue versus red, the red is what's supposed to normally be on the outside and, and we know that's phosphatidyl, uh, let's see, so which ones are on the inside? So we know that phosphatidylserine is on the inside and I think it's 
sphingomyelin is on the inside, so that means phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylethanolamine are on the outside, whereas, so this is phosphatidylserine and sphingomyelin are inside, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine outside, and you have exactly the opposite in the inside out vesicles. So what? So what would you do with that? Well, you could start by looking at proteins and, and adding them to these membranes. And how do you do that? You, you actually can generate proteins using bacteria as little factories, purify the, the protein out of them, and add them directly into these membrane preparations. And if these are transmembrane proteins, right, if you have a a protein that has a transmembrane region and you throw this in with one of these uh, let's just draw it like it was on the previous page, right? So with one of these uh, leaky ghosts what might happen is that this particular protein might go and embed itself in the membrane and what's that going to look like? Well, what it should look like is that now you have a protein right where the the hydrophobic portion or the transmembrane region is in the membrane of that particular ghost cell red blood cell ghost rbc ghosts and what can you do with that well you can look at that protein and say what happens if i treat these cells now that have this in it with a uh, enzyme it might cut off part of the protein, so let me get another color here. Right, so if I can enzymatically digest it and a piece of this comes off, um, right, depending on where it cuts, it tells you something about that protein. If none of it gets cut, well, maybe that means that the protein itself was all inside the cell. In general, red blood cell ghosts are a thing of the past because I think I already mentioned this to you. I can go to a catalog and buy myself some lipids. So I go to the catalog, I buy myself phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine, sphingomyelin. I buy some cholesterol and I mix that all up in an aqueous solution and it will make, okay, we have to usually put in a little bit of um, agitation to make these lipid bilayer structures that are of a large enough size that we can use them in experiments. And this is called making liposomes. Okay. So liposomes really have gotten rid of, right, have replaced blood cell ghosts. And replaced them because they're just easier to do. Red blood cells, you have to deal with red blood cells. Number one, you have to get blood from somebody. Requires a human protocol. And then working with blood these days is not a great thing because people have diseases and who wants to expose themselves to that? Go to a catalog, buy the phospholipids and cholesterol, and make your own liposomes. All right, well, now, how do we also uh, deal with getting proteins into and out of lipid bilayers? One of the things that I'm hoping you all do all the time, all day, is detergent solubilization. When you wash your hands with detergent, what you're really doing is you're trying to remove dead skin, skin cells off of your hands and remove any uh, microorganisms or dirt that might be there. And the reason that this works is because detergents look just like lipids because all detergents have some hydrocarbon portion to the detergent. Now, I'm showing you two detergents here in this particular uh, image. One of them is called SDS, and SDS is highly negatively charged. It's got a huge negative charge on it with this big hydrocarbon tail, and it's very harsh detergent. If you add SDS to cells, it solubilizes all membranes, all membranes. So I'm not just talking about the plasma membrane, I'm talking about the uh, membrane of the ER, the membrane of the Golgi, the membrane of endosomes, the membrane of mitochondria, everything, all membranes will be disrupted by SDS. 
Now, there are other kinds of detergent, so non-ionic detergents. So this one, Triton X100, shown over here, has this really crazy shape to it. But this is a much more mild detergent, so if you use Triton, you might be able to selectively, so think of it as a selective, membrane permeabilization. You can open up holes in membranes or you might only solubilize the plasma membrane. It's used to solubilize particular compartments in the cell or the cell itself. So detergents allow us to purify proteins away from lipids. And when does that occur? Well, when you have a, a transmembrane protein that's bound to a cell, it has a portion of it that is hydrophobic. So this region in the middle here, shown in dark green, is hydrophobic, but it also, this transmembrane protein has two hydrophilic domains. Remember, this makes a protein amphipathic. And amphipathicity, is that a word? Amphipathicity, amphipathic. Uh, actually makes it difficult to get the protein out of the membrane unless you treat with something such as a detergent. Now detergents actually are, right, I told you they're hydrocarbon. Sometimes they have a, a negative charge on them, so let's just take SDS, and then it has a hydrocarbon tail. So it's got this head with a tail, head with a tail, head with a tail. Looks almost like it's like a Instead of phospholipid, it's got one tail instead of two. And detergents often form into these uh, structures called micelles. I don't know why it's called a micelle, but you think of it as my. It's just one layer. Instead of a bilayer, it's an individual. Uh, so the, phosph uh, the polar head group is in contact with the aqueous solution, and the hydrophobic portion is on the inside, hidden away from the the aqueous solution. Think about what happens when you put detergent, if you add a little detergent in a bottle of water and you shake it up, you see lots of bubbles on top, but then you see tons of little bubbles, what look like little bubbles, inside. And those are detergent micelles. Now, when you add detergent, and th those are formed up of detergent monomers. When you add detergent into a cell, what that does is allow you to interact specifically with either the protein. So notice on the left here, I'm showing you a protein that's bound by detergent. The detergents are binding to the hydrophobic portion of the protein, the transmembrane domain, that probably has uh, amino acid side chains that are hydrophobic, alanine, glycine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, etc. Whereas you also have the detergents binding to the hydrophobic portion of the phospholipids and that allows for you to separate the phospholipids from the proteins. And so now in a solution you would have these two sets of molecules separated from one another, both of them bound to detergents, so how do you actually then separate a protein out from from the lipids, right? If they're both in solution together, how do you get them separated from one another? And so this is a typical experiment where what you do is here's you're interested in studying a protein in this membrane. You solubilize the membrane using lipid detergent. It separates these proteins out from the rest of the lipids. So here are the lipids. How do you purify it? Well, you have to do something to separate the lipids from the proteins. And the easiest thing to do is to, to do centrifugation. Or you can uh, do column chromatography. And that allows you to separate the two things. And then if you have a pure co protein complex, you can then put that into a detergent micelle, that, I mean not detergent, into a micelle that you've made and ask questions about that protein, that specific protein. Notice they skipped this concept. How about these other proteins? How would they be separated out? And it gets a little more complicated, but you can do centrifugation at different uh, speeds to separate bigger things from smaller things, etc. And finally, the last technique that I want to talk about is SDS page electrophoresis. SDS is sodium dodecyl sulfate. That's the detergent that I just told you, one of the harshest detergents, very negatively charged. And PAGE stands for polyacrylamide 
G is gel. Electrophoresis is the E. So this is actually a little, little redundant. SDS page is SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Okay. This is the technique that uh, everybody uses when they want to look at what proteins are actually around. And so we can separate out proteins and separate them based on size and also sometimes on shape and look at if we have standards, what molecular weight is a protein? Is the protein that was in the actually in a cell the molecular weight that we would expect based on the gene sequence and the amino acid sequence? And this gives us information about the protein. So uh, SDS page starts with, uh, you should all have run one of these at some point in time. If you haven't, you would run one in 381. Um, if you work in a lab, you definitely run these. And these are almost always uh, vertical gels. So the gel is up and down with respect to, it's not lying flat on the bench top. And you load samples up here. And what happens is the gel, the poly, the acrylamide, actually creates a lattice work of of material that the proteins have to then migrate through and so a protein that would be migrating through would take you know a small protein would go fast whereas a bigger protein might take longer to get through etc and so what this image is trying to show you let's just make it a little bigger is that with proteins you depending on the size of the proteins here they're showing three proteins A, B, and C and in lane this first lane they only oh, sorry about that in this first lane they only ran this particular portion of of the protein and what they find is that you get a protein of this size right so here and that corresponds to the larger of the two proteins, the B part, compared to the smaller protein. And up, up above, how were these proteins linked together? Right here is showing you that this is a quaternary structure that's linked through a disulfide bond. So you have two polypeptide chains linked to one another through a disulfide bond. So you can actually have quaternary structure that's covalently bound and that you actually have two proteins in that particular sample. And that's compared to over here, we have sample C, it's run in a different well, and what would happen if all of these were run, okay, let's just say there was a third well in this gel where we loaded the total sample, you would expect to see all three proteins, right, so you would have B, C, and A show up all in the same lane. So what does that mean over in this real gel over here, shown in, in lanes 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? These are different samples from cells, and what you can see in sample 1 is a lot, a lot of proteins. And what's happening from sample 1 to sample 2 to sample 3 to sample 4 to sample 5 is that they're purifying out this particular protein and that can be done in a number of different ways but what they're showing you is the SDS page of this particular process okay so I think that might end this lecture um, I will be giving you another one and I will send there will be two quizzes one one about this stuff uh, and then another one you can have all weekend to take both of them and then I'll see you again on Tuesday have a great night